Hi, I'm Rob Cosman. Welcome to my shop. Today we're going to talk about edge glue joints because you're not always going to find wide boards like this. Most frequently you're going to have to glue two or more boards in order to get the wood you want. There are decisions to be made based on what joint, type of glue. I'm going to walk you through all of it. Stay with us. <laughs> I'm Rob Cosman and welcome to my shop. We make it our job to help take your woodworking to the next level. If you're new and you haven't subscribed, please do so. Hit the notification bell so you'll receive alerts when we release a new video. And anytime we use a special tool, we'll always leave a description down below. All right, let's get to work. Lots of options when you're choosing the glue. The idea is to choose the glue that you're most comfortable with and is right for the job. So I'm going to go through and I'll show you some. I'm going to talk to, talk to you specifically about the ones that I use. The, uh, we'll start with the regular. So here's yellow glue called aliphatic resin. Uh, it's common. Everybody knows about it and uses it. The downside to it is it loses a lot of its strength at about 120 degrees Fahrenheit. You can check with the manufacturer on that to verify it. But I've had projects fail, so I no longer use that one. In fact, what I use now is Type Bond 3. This also has absolutely no water resistance. Type Bond 3 gives you a little more open time. That means that when you spread your glue, you've got a little more time before it starts to get skin over and not be very effective. It's also water resistant, not for building a boat, but it's good for outdoor use. So I, uh, it has all the properties of this glue, plus the fact that it's waterproof, so that's why I, I use it. Now this is a uh, polyurethane glue and uh, I use it in some applications. It tends to expand almost like expanding foam so you have to be aware of that and uh, it does adhere just about every material that you can find but it's also one of those things that you start using it next thing you know you've got it all over you. So I don't use a lot of it but I do use it in specific applications where I'm having to glue ceramic, metal, anything like that to wood. This is cyanacrylate. It comes in three different, four different consistencies actually. Thin, which is a consistency of water, and then medium that would be more like a syrup, and then there's thick that would be almost like molasses, and I think you can even get a thicker one than that. So this comes in handy because it's instant, especially the thin one, but it has some restrictions. The thin one only works when the two pieces are tight. It works through capillary action. Uh, I don't, re I don't use it, I don't use the thick stuff in place of this type of a glue because I find it doesn't hold as well but there are applications with a thin one that I think surpass all other glues and that's when I, uh, when you're putting a box together something like this and you've got a tight joint where it would be awkward to try to glue all four corners at the same time you can put this whole thing together and then just hit it with the thin cyanacrylate and it'll wick all around there and it just does a great job that way. Then there's epoxy. Epoxy use, almost always comes as two part and has to be mixed before it sets up. What's nice about epoxy is that you, uh, you can get it with a five minute set, you can get it with a 15 minute set, you can get it with an hour long set. So if you need the extra open time or you want to be able to arrange your pieces after you put it together or as I can say I wouldn't use it on a big job just because of the expense of it. I'm going to show you a better option than that. But, it's, it's relatively expensive for the amount of glue that you get, but in certain applications it's great. And as I mentioned, you have to thoroughly mix it before it's activated and will start to cure. We have hot melt glue. So this is a, what I would call a temporary glue, although in certain applications it, can be, it would be considered permanent. I use it if I'm just building a mock-up and I want to put something together temporarily just to see what it's going to look like. It's quick and uh, relatively inexpensive. So this is the glue that I use if I'm doing a lamination where you've got a large surface that you have to deal with and you need lots of open time. I think they tell you that the open time is almost an hour on this, but I found that much after 20 minutes and it starts to skin over, so I wouldn't go a full hour. Now this is a powder and you mix it with water. And uh, I'll warn you that you put the powder into the water, not the water into the powder. If you put the water into the powder, you'll never get it mixed. You put the powder into the water and you just continue to mix it as you add more and more and it'll work. So get the right glue. Don't get overwhelmed by it. I think if you're stuck with that and uh, maybe this 
and this, you'd probably be all set. But, of course, you're going to have to match it to whatever it is that you're building. But there's lots of glues out there, and it's worth doing a little bit of research to find out what one is going to be best suited for you if you have a specific application outside of normal wood-to-wood -wood gluing. When we talk about edge joint, what we're talking about is gluing two pieces or more, two or more pieces of wood together along their long grain. So these are two pieces of torrified maple. This would be end grain against long grain. What we're talking about is gluing long grain to long grain. And it represents an extremely strong joint. I glued together two pieces of pine. The glue joint's right in the middle to try to give you an ex uh, demonstrate this. So I'll broke, I, if I break that, it did not break on the glue joint, okay? There's your glue joint over there and over there. In fact, no part of the glue joint actually let go. So it creates a bond that is stronger than the wood itself, which means you usually don't need to have anything reinforcing it other than just the glue. But there's a couple of characteristics that are essential in order for that joint to work well. So when I'm doing it, what I'm looking for is two straight edges, and I want them to be square. When they come together, I don't want any gaps. I want to have them as close to being flush as possible, meaning you don't want one sticking up or, or uh, uh, popped up in the middle or out at the end. That's just going to make it very difficult. And in the process of leveling it, if you've got a high spot and a low spot, then you're going to lose that much over the entire area. So you've got to be careful about that. So in addition to what I mentioned, the other thing is, and what I think is even more important, and I'm not so sure people pay enough attention to it, is the continuity of the grain. So I would mix, mix and match and try to find it so that that joint almost disappears just because of the way the grain runs. And this obviously would not be a very good match. You've got dark and light and it's quite obvious that the joint is right there. There may be times when you want to accentuate it. But usually, if I'm trying to get a larger piece of one particular type of wood, I want that to look like one continuous piece. That's the reason why I pointed out, if you can get nice wide boards like that, I always leave them that way. There's an old wives' tale that people used to adhere to where they would take a board like that, cut it in narrow strips, flip, one, flip each one around, which would make a complete mess of the nice figure in the wood and really did not solve any problems, particularly now that we live in homes that are climate controlled and your moisture content is not going to move very much at all from season to season. If you're going to glue up large panels, you're going to have to have some form of a clamp. There's two options. The most common would be what are called pipe clamps. They come three-quarter and half. These are three-quarter. These are pretty standard. You find them just about anywhere. Buy a black pipe clamp or pipe, get it threaded on one end, and you can pick up the clamp sections at any hardware. Or you can get F clamps. I'll deal with the pipe clamps first. So if I'm going to glue up three boards, like that. I'm going to probably put one clamp here. I could get away with three, but I'm going to go with four. So I'm going to go one here, one here, one here, one here, but I've got to alternate them. And by alternate them, what I mean is one on top, one on bottom. So I'll space out two like that. We put these in. And by the way, there's two different types I have pipe clamps that you can get. And I'll show you and I'll also tell you my recommendation. I don't think I have any right here. Actually, I got this one. This one. So this one has a cam on the back. So to release it, you pull up on the cam and then when pressure is applied, that cam will has teeth on it and it'll bite into the, steel, into the pipe. But it also leaves gouges like this, which end up in metal splinters. I much prefer this style that has Half of the four or five pieces of steel, they're spring-loaded, and they have a tendency to catch much faster. Now, they do the same thing as far as tearing up the steel, but you'll find that these have a tendency to slip at when you least want it, and these always grab. So I would go with those, and they tend to be the more expensive, by the way. So here's how we would do our spacing. Probably move this down to about here. Now, the reason you want to do this is because the pipe... Have a, the clamps have a tendency to pull in one direction. Meaning if you put them all on one side, they're going to, if they were all on the top, they'd have a tendency to cup the board like this. So this alternates the pressure. So in doing that, I would put this one here. And you can count on the pressure going out at about a 45 degree angle from the clamp head. 
So that in that case, you can see that I could easily get away with three here, but I'm going to go with four. So that one would sit there. I'm going to work with this piece of cardboard on my bench. And then one here. And this one would be out there. Evenly spaced. Now, if you do this, uh, the one you have to be aware that that's going to leave marks in your wood. So you've got to either put some kind of a yes, protective strip in there, or you can do this, which I find is a really good help. I've taken hardwood dowel and I've split it in half, and then I clamp or uh, tape it in place, just so that it's not falling on me when I'm trying to work, especially under the pressure of having glue drying. If you put it on your an edge like that, it'll help put the pressure right down through the middle of the board. So instead of allowing the clamp to pull on the inside or on the outside, because it makes contact on the top of the radius, all that pressure will go right down through the center of the board and do a much better job of holding it together. And you can make up a bunch of these and then just have them when you need them. So I would take the time to have four, uh, two of those in every spot where you have the clamp and that's probably going to guarantee your best success coming from this. Now if you don't go with pipe clamps, what I have found and as the longer I've done this the more I've realized that probably apply way more clamping pressure than is required. In fact if you're having to squeeze the life out of it it's probably because your two edges aren't straight or something's not fitting properly. So I've come to like these F clamps made by Bessie a whole lot more. They're easier to handle. They are not capable of applying the same amount of pressure, which keeps you from overdoing it. But you can come in here. If you buy the good ones, they have six serrated edges. So it's kind of an I-beam type affair. And there's a serrated edge here, here, and here, and the same thing on the other side, which simply means that when you want that to lock, it's got a better chance of biting. The less expensive clamps only have a serrated edge right here and back there, and they're the ones that tend to slide. So I would come in here like this on the end, and I want to make sure that I'm, I've got the head of the clamp or the part that bites, and back here, right in the middle of the board, put that one on there. I might go with four, even with this. And you just want to get uh, just enough squeeze out to know that you didn't starve the joint of glue. You don't want so much that you've got a mess running all over the place and you don't want so little that you don't see any glue coming out because then you may end up having not applied enough. So those are the two types of clamps that I would uh, suggest and I really favor the F clamps. Okay, this is the part of the process that I don't think folks spend enough time on. This is the part that people are going to, it's going to catch their attention more so than anything else. And that is the continuity of the grain. So first thing I would do is lay those pieces out and put them together. Now this is aspen, it's very blonde, it's almost hard to see, but even still I want to try to get a nice match. So what I would do is typically take one board and find out which edge or which face looks best. Not really any distinguishing marks on any of them. If I had a knot or uh, any kind of a blemish, then I would keep that on the bottom side. But this piece, they all look to be equally plain. I'll stick with that. So now it's just a matter of switching around. So you've got a little bit of something going on here, which doesn't pair up very well with that side. So I might switch that. Now I've got some lines that are running down through here and I've almost got the same thing going on on this piece. So that would make for a good joint over here. So we've got rather straight lines coming down here, but we've got a little bit of figure right there and that's not really very uh, complimentary. So if we switch it around like that, that's yeah, better. Flip it over. I said this is hard to see because it's so white. I don't know whether that's any better. 
That one definitely isn't. I think I'll go back to this one. Now I could also possibly move this over here since I'm only gluing up three boards. That doesn't do me any favors. Nor does that. Nope. No. Nope. I think I was better off back over here. And of course this is subjective. Okay. So as far as looks, I think that's probably going to be the best solution. But now, once this is glued up, I'm going to have to plane it down. So I want the grain to be running in the same direction, if at all possible. So if I can't tell by feeling it, I would actually take the time to go in and just plane that surface lightly with a hand plane and find out if I have one direction that works better than another. And if I do, then I'd label it put an arrow in the direction that I want to plane and then I've got to match these other ones up to it as well. If not, particularly if you're dealing with woods like this tend to be uh, really easy to tear if you go the wrong direction. So you're trying to plane this and you've got a nice smooth surface here and here and this one's going the wrong way and it's all ripped up and torn. So that's something you need to pay attention to. When I build my bench and it's made out of sec several pieces of wood, I actually go in and I plane the top edge of each piece and I mark it so that when I'm planing the whole thing, it's much easier when all the grain is running in the same direction. That's not a bad idea to employ in any circumstance where you're going to have multiple pieces. Once you've laid out your board so that it looks good, then you want to go in and identify it so that as you're moving boards around and getting things ready, you can always come back to it. So if you just draw a big triangle in pencil, across the joint, and it doesn't matter what happens, there's only one way to put that back together. So now I've got two glue joints, and rather than try to do two at the same time, I'm just going to do one. So I'm going to look at this, and if your power jointer is set up properly, you should be able to have a good joint. I'm going to show you how we can make this one even better, but that looks to be okay. I don't see any gaps. So let's get ready to glue that one up, and I'm actually going to do it and show you how I would go about the process. But I want to get a piece of cardboard. I don't like gluing on my bench. But if you take the time when you're doing this and to do it carefully, it's going to save you a whole bunch of time at the other end. If you glue these up and they're misaligned, now you've got to take a whole lot of material off. It's not worth the effort. So we're going to spend a little bit of time now. I've got some uh, half dowels to protect it. To protect the edge and to help distribute the pressure properly. I'll use some painter's tape just to hold them in place. Set these up. Top. Every other one will be opposite. Get those to sit there without falling over. That's not going to sit there very well, so I'll move it over. You want a nice, even coat of glue. I only need to do one side. I use my finger, allow my thumb to keep everything right in the middle, meaning my thumb is rubbing on the inside edge, keeping that so that the bead of glue stays right down the middle. 
You want an even coat. Make sure there's glue on all of the wood. You don't want it running all over the place. It just makes it difficult to get rid of afterward. Be nice if that thing would stay put. Might be asking too much. Come on, clamp. Okay, now I'm going to start out here. And I'll just use my fingers to get that flush. Don't want to be too tight just yet, just enough to pull it together. The clamp helps to keep the pressure right down through the middle. So the next one's going to go across the top. I didn't do a very good job of lining those up, but they're close enough. Now, you, you want to be careful because these get marked up over time and it'll end up, as it pulls, it'll end up leaving scratches on here. So you may need to just put something there temporarily to keep that up off of the board. Now, I need to get this flush, so from down here, I can just lift a little bit until that makes... Okay, that's good. That's good. And we'll pull this one in. This one's high, so I'm going to pull it up like so. That's flush. I need to come up off of here, so I'll just hold it. Line this up. There. Okay, snug that up. Same amount of pressure on all of them. eyeball that They're not pulling it too much you don't need a ton of pressure and you want a little bit of squeeze out there's not a ton there but there's enough that I know I don't have a starved joint so if I've got a third piece to add on there I'll wait for this to dry give it at least a half an hour then I only have to manage one glue wet joint at a time the first time I was shown this I didn't believe it. Dale Nish actually introduced us to it. I say us because it was in a beginning woodworking class at BYU. And it's called a rub joint, meaning you don't use any clamps. You just simply put glue on there. You rub it for a... It didn't take very long until it no longer moves. And then just let it sit. It's actually surprisingly strong. Now the problem is that if it was of any length, it would be a little bit difficult to do. But these pieces are a little bit over 12 inches long. So I'll show you how it is. So, a couple of pieces of red oak, not that the species matters. Apply the glue like we did. Make sure you got an even coat. And then just put the other piece on. I suppose you can put it in the vise, it'd make it a little bit easier, give you a third hand. And just move that forward and back and it'll start to stick. In fact, it won't take very long and you won't be able to move it. I remember him demonstrating it and he just took two small pieces of wood together. And while he was talking to us, he, he held them and it didn't seem very long. And then he handed it to several of us and said, see if you can break it. And we couldn't break it. So that's about all it'll take. Now, I would just set that aside and come back and try to break that at some point after 30 or 40 minutes of drying and we'll just see how tough it actually is. Now if you have a long glue joint or multiple boards and you want to save some time you can always use some form of an alignment. So you can use dowels, you can use splines, you can use biscuits. I find it just as easy to use a long spline providing that you don't mind or you're not going to be having to look at the spline from the end. That's the only downside. But I think this is the more convenient of all the methods to do. So the first thing I've got to do is cut some spline material. It doesn't have to be very long. I'm going to suggest half an inch on this. 
So I've got some eighth inch Baltic birch plywood. Set the fence for half an inch. That splitter is actually sticking up too high, but I gotta take it off for this next procedure. Now, providing that's gonna fit, which it should, that's an eighth of an inch blade and that's an eighth of an inch Baltic birch. Now we want to be up just a little bit better than a quarter of an inch. I'll actually test that. I want to put this in the middle. In this case, eyeballing it is enough. I also want to hold it tight against the fence so that I don't have it, I'm not having to do it by hand, and I want to make sure that it's going to be right down the middle. What good is it to uh, cut an alignment slot in there if it's not going to be right on? So some form of a feather board is helpful. To do, oh, I didn't, didn't lock it. Move that in just a little bit. Get a piece of scrap first and see if that. So we need a quarter of an inch in each piece. That's a little better than a quarter, so that'll do. Just gonna check and make sure. Now that's a little bit sloppy. We'll try it and see. I'm gonna keep my good face against the fence. I've got some sawing burr on the back, so I'm just gonna get a sanding block to get that off. You could always make your spline material out of solid wood, but the grain's gonna be running opposite of the way you want for any strength. That's why plywood is so much easier. That could be a little better fit, but it might do the job. Now, try it first. Wouldn't hurt to cut a little chamfer along there too to help that go together. Now the problem with this, there's just enough slop to almost defeat the purpose. So I'm going to suggest that we find another piece of plywood. We want it to fit a little snugger than that in order for it to do the job. However, once we've done that, I find it easier if you actually go in and just glue that in place first on one piece so that you're not trying to juggle both. It's also going to help strengthen the joint if you need a little bit of extra strength. So if that's already done, make sure you don't have any glue left in the corner in here. And then once that's all glued up, you can go ahead, apply all your glue to this piece, put it together and clamp it. But let's see if I can't find something that fits a little bit better than that. If you try to be close and you're woodworking, or really close, this is the type of thing that's gonna drive you crazy. So I use a lot of Baltic birch plywood, eighth inch. And as I went around the shop and checked, this piece comes in at 115. This piece comes in at 123, and all over the board. So even that piece isn't gonna be thick enough. Interestingly enough, the kerf, which should have been one 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 two five, 
came in at almost 10 thou over. So what I'm going to do is go in, I'm going to make some. We only need it for alignment purposes. I'm going to make it out of solid wood, which means it's not going to strengthen the joint much. However, we've got lots of surface area there anyway, so it won't matter. I'll make it cut. Now that says 135, but I never want to rely on actual measuring. I'd rather be able to go in there and fit it. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to go over and I'm just going to snap off the end of this so that I can actually put that piece right in. If I need to make it a little smaller, I can just move the fence over while it's fairly short. All right, so if I go in there, that's a little too tight. So we'll move this over slightly. Now, that's a little bit snug, and over a long distance like that, a lot of resistance. Bring it down a little more. That's better. Now, hopefully we can cut it and keep it exactly that width. Now, instead of cutting another piece, I'm going to go over and cut this into segments and we'll just place it so that we use up or we go the full distance. Also, I need to cut this down to half inch. Now I could have made enough so that it was continuous, but it's only for alignment purposes. So the fact that there's a bit of a gap in between them is not going to matter. Now we make sure there's no debris that's going to interfere. And as I said, you could go in and glue these in ahead of time. Although it's not needed for extra glue strength, there's plenty of strength just on the wood to wood contact. That little chamfer that we cut will help get that started. Put that together and then check it. That's flush, 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 flush. You could do multiple boards as long as the glue you're using gave you the amount of open time and you could put them all together at once. Now, the only thing is, if, you're, if that's going to be shown, then you may not want to do it this way. And there are other methods. You can use a uh, biscuit joiner. You can even use dowels, but that's a lot of extra work. I think the spline method is the best. Okay, for this last one, we're going to do it using the hand plane, and we're going to do something called a sprung joint, which simply means that when it goes together, it's going to be tight out on the ends, and there's going to be a slight gap in the middle, very, very slight. But the first thing we want to do is improve this by planing it so we get rid of those little ripple marks. So anytime you use a jointer, it's a rotary cutting action. It's going to have little scallop or ripple marks all the way along that board. We can make it a little bit better if we want. So we'll put this in the vise, use a plane with a freshly sharpened blade, get that blade parallel to the sole, and retract it. And as you're pulling the blade in, you can always make a little more of an adjustment. I'm going to pull it all the way in so it's not projecting at all. And as I plane, I'm going to start spinning the adjuster. And I want to watch to see where the first bit of shaving comes out because I want it to be across the width of the board. Seems to be all right. Okay, now 
I'm purposely going to create a little hollow. So I'm going to come in here to the near the middle and I'm going to start, go about uh, 12 inches or so and then lift the plane up while in, in a forward motion. Come back a little farther and go forward a little farther, lifting the plane up in a forward motion so that the uh, shaving ends and doesn't leave a, what I would call a skin tag. I'm going to come back and do that again. Very light pass. Now this time I'm going to go full length. Okay. Make sure I can't feel any start stop marks. I'm going to set that aside and we'll do the same thing on this one. I'll go full length first to make sure that we're free of any defects on the surface. Now we'll come in here about a foot and a little longer. Each time coming back a little farther and going ahead a little farther. Not quite all the way. Come back in here and take a little more off. Hopefully you're keeping things square. Now, let me just run my fingers over that. Yeah, I feel a little bit of a transition mark right there, so I'm going to take one more complete pass. Now, we'll set this piece on by lining up the marks. Now, I definitely don't want to bump in the middle, so if, I, if this pivots, we're in trouble, but it doesn't. It touches on the outside edges. Now, just curious to see how much it's how much of a gap we have so I'm going to use my feeler gauge and the smallest one I have here is one and a half thousandths of an inch so I'll see if I can put that in there okay I can pull that out if I come out here it pulls the whole thing, so I know I'm making contact out there in the edges. Yeah, that's good. So when we clamp it, we're sure to keep those edges tight. We've got an ever so slight gap in the middle. Now, I just want to make sure that we didn't throw those edges out of square. So I'm going to take a straight edge and put it on here. And that lines up. If that was tilting one way or the other, then I know we, we were no longer square. Let me so now that's nice and flat. We can go ahead, do the same type of a glue up. We'll put our, our little half dowels on here, clamp that together with some glue, and we'll get an even better joint. Probably one that you can't see with the naked eye, but ah, uh, you're gonna feel better about it. If you enjoy my method of work and like my style of teaching, click on any one of these videos to help take your woodworking to the next level. Now I've always said, better tools make the job so much easier. If you click on the icon with the plane and the chisel, it'll take you to our website, introduce you to all of our tools that we actually manufacture right here, as well as our workshops, both in person and online. Good luck.